Uh, with the notes, though, they're all the same size and colour. It's very easy to be shortchanged with a $1 note, say, instead of a 10. There are four main coins, one cent, often called a penny, five cents, a nickel, 10 cents, confusingly smaller than five cents, called a dime, and 25 cents, a quarter. Because of the volatility of the exchange rate, we're going to quote all costs in dollars. By the way, don't take pound notes or sterling traveller's cheques. You'll have great difficulty exchanging them. Take instead dollar traveller's cheques. You don't need to go to a bank to change them. You can use them like money in most shops and hotels. Also, if you've got a credit card, take it. America is geared up to plastic money, and it's almost a necessity when hiring a car or booking at a hotel. Access, incidentally, is called MasterCard there. Prices in America are never what they seem on the tag or on the menu. You must always add on the local sales tax. This varies from county to county and ranges from 6% in some parts of Los Angeles to 7.25% in San Diego. Now getting there. The flight times are long. There are direct flights to both Los Angeles and San Diego and they take about 11 hours. If you stop to refuel, add an extra hour. There's an eight-hour time difference, so that if you left the UK at, say, 11 in the morning, the earliest you would arrive would be 2 p.m. local time. Getting through Immigration and Customs can easily take an hour and a half. That's 3.30 p.m., but your body thinks it's still British time, and that's 11.30 at night, so you're going to be feeling very tired. Our advice is that if you're hiring a car, book your first night's accommodation somewhere near the airport. When you collect your car, you'll need to show your driving license. An international license is not necessary. And you'll need a credit card as surety. If you haven't won and have not paid in advance, you might well have to pay the full hire cost in cash. Now the driving. Los Angeles has the most extensive network of motorways in the world. They call them freeways, but that network is increasingly overcrowded. Their peak periods are 7 till 9 in the morning and from 4 to 7 in the afternoon. Then freeway traffic is bumper to bumper for miles. At peak time, slip roads are often controlled, only one car on at a time. Once you're on the freeway, you'll find that vehicles will overtake on both sides and watch the overhead signs. If you're in the right-hand lane, you may well be forced to exit, whether you want to or not. Also, exit signs may not be marked until quite late, so you really have to keep your wits about you at all times. Many radio stations carry regular traffic bulletins. To find them of much use, though, you need to be familiar with the freeway system. The speed limit on the urban freeways is 55, although it's often less. One rule, which takes some getting used to, is that you can turn right on a red light providing the road is clear. You'll find that parking in most areas is not normally a problem. There are usually plenty of meters. The cost varies, though 50 cents an hour is about average. Traffic wardens, by the way, are common. You must always park in the same direction as the traffic on your side. Otherwise, it's illegal. A couple of useful points when driving. All the road numbers assume that America is a perfect grid of north-south roads crossing east-west roads. North-south roads are always odd numbers, east-west roads are even, and that applies from freeways to country roads. The towns, of course, are normally laid out in a grid. Each square is called a block, and the road along each block usually has a hundred numbers. 1125 Lincoln Boulevard is in the 11th block, and the street sign usually shows the address numbers. Also, there are always street names at each corner, so addresses are easy to find. Now a detailed look at the area, and incidentally all the film was shot in March. We'll look at Los Angeles first. In size, it's vast, about 65 miles from north to south. The international airport, known as LAX, is in the west. The centre of Los Angeles, called downtown, is 13 miles to the east and is mainly an administrative area. Most Britons make for Anaheim, home of Disneyland, which we'll cover next week, or the Hollywood area in the northwest. People expecting glitz and glamour are usually disappointed with Hollywood. The area around Hollywood Boulevard is very ordinary, even sleazy looking. The main focal point is a cinema, Man's Chinese Theatre. This odd landmark, a mixture of Chinese and Polynesian styles, was made famous by the custom of celebrities leaving their foot and handprints in the cement in the forecourt. 
Started in the late 20s, it's a permanent record of the golden age of Hollywood. It's always busy with tourists seeing how they size up with the famous. On the pavement outside the theatre is another spot the name game. This is the Walk of Fame, a line of over 1,800 stars marked with the great names from the entertainment industry, and they add new ones at the rate of about one a month. If you're chosen, you have to pay about $3,000 for the honour. Another attraction in this area is the Max Factor Museum of Beauty, a look at Hollywood makeup through the years. It's free, and there's a shop where you can buy discount cosmetics. Paramount is the last of the great studios still in Hollywood. Its entrance reflects the age when the area was synonymous with glamour, extravagant living and world-famous stars. Nowadays, most of the work is making television series, some of which are shown in the UK. Running right through Hollywood is Sunset Boulevard and its famous Sunset Strip. It's nothing to write home about, a long stretch of road lined with billboards. In entertainment terms, it's now a centre for improvisational comedy. The well-known nightclubs have gone. Ciro's, one of the most famous, is now the Comedy Store, but it's not all nostalgia. In West Hollywood, a star is worn as a second-hand clothes shop with a difference. All the stock is celebrity cast-offs being sold for charity. So if you fancy a John Travolta shirt or a Cher blouse, this is the place for you. To locate some of those places, Man's Chinese Theatre is on the north side of Hollywood Boulevard. The Walk of Fame runs along Hollywood Boulevard and down Vine Street. Paramount Studios are by Melrose Avenue and Sunset Boulevard actually stretches 22 miles from the coast to downtown. Sunset Strip is a two-mile section around La Cienega Boulevard. Incidentally, that famous Hollywood sign in the Hollywood Hills is visible from various points in Los Angeles, but the best place to take a photo is along Beechwood Drive, north of Hollywood Boulevard. The other glamorous-sounding district in that area is Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills is associated the world over with money. The houses say it all, ranging from southern plantation style to design a ramshackle out of an idea from a Disney film. The most visited street in Beverly Hills is Rodeo Drive, a neighborhood shopping area with a difference. Here is the most concentrated collection of expensive shops anywhere in North America. Most of the names are world famous. But don't expect to be too successful. One of the best ways of seeing Beverly Hills is to take their version of a local bus. It's called a trolley and costs a dollar any distance. The smart part of Rodeo Drive is between Santa Monica Boulevard and Wilshire Boulevard. Many tourists like to go and see what the film stars' houses look like. In reality, the best ones are usually hidden from view, but you can buy maps showing who lives or used to live where. We came across Vince, who personally marks out a route. Dunaway, Solid, Mitzi Gaynor, Ann Miller, Smokey Robinson, that's Shirley Jones. Any questions? He gears his spiel to your nationality and special interests. His map costs around $6, including the patter. There are also guided coach trips that take you past the stars' homes for about $25, but you stand more chance of actually seeing stars if you go to watch some location filming. There's always some taking place in the Los Angeles area. If you're interested, you can get a full schedule of what's being shot each day from the Motion Picture Coordination Office on Hollywood Boulevard. It's called the Shoot Sheet and costs nothing. Now let's look at the coast. You'll find the sand is generally fine and golden. We'll start with Malibu. Despite its famous name and glamorous image, Malibu in reality is not that interesting. The actual town straggles the very busy Pacific Coast Highway. There is a pier at the centre of the resort. Next to it, a public beach, which is popular with surfers. The sand is soft and pale, but the sea gets deep very quickly. To the east is a long stretch of beach, but because the whole shoreline is jammed tight with expensive beach homes, it's quite difficult to find a way on. There is no promenade here. To the west of the town is Malibu Lagoon State Beach. This salt marsh, open to the public, is a popular feeding area for a wide variety of shorebirds and marine life all year round. You can in fact drive through Malibu and hardly see the sea because of the houses. The best place to get onto the beach is by the pier and then walk along. Just outside Malibu is the J. Paul Getty Museum, which houses what is fast becoming one of the greatest art collections in the world. This is free, but if you're driving, you must have a car park reservation. You usually need to give at least a week's notice. 
Now Santa Monica, the biggest resort in the area. The beach at Santa Monica is a three mile stretch of soft pale sand that's kept very clean. Running through the sand are well used cycle paths. They're about as wide as an English country lane and you're supposed to keep to the right. There are good beach facilities including volleyball and children's playgrounds. All along the back of the beach is a pedestrianised promenade with snack bars and pizzerias. You'll also find shops that hire out bikes and roller skates. Skates are a bit cheaper than bikes. Santa Monica's focal point is the pier. Though it's a bit dilapidated, it's reminiscent of a British seaside resort with amusement arcades, cheap cafes and souvenir shops. It gets very packed at weekends. Ocean Avenue, the main seafront road running along the cliff top, however, has style. This area, together with Main Street, one block back from the coast, is where the most interesting, though often expensive, shops are. In Heritage Square, many of the shops have an old world feel, and Santa Monica has its own outlet for movie celebrity cast-offs. It's called Starwares. Santa Monica is on the freeway system. In fact, the Santa Monica freeway is the beginning of Interstate Highway 10, a motorway running over 2,000 miles to Jacksonville, Florida. Virtually next door to Santa Monica is Venice Beach. The beach at Venice is surprisingly not the main attraction, although by anybody's standards it's very good. A wide stretch of soft sand shelving gently into the Pacific Ocean. What pulls visitors to Venice Beach is Oceanfront Walk, a two mile long pedestrianised area lined with shops, cafes and stalls selling the usual t-shirts, beachwear and cheap sunglasses. It is however an unusual and at times exciting area, for this is considered the roller skating capital of the world. The best time to go is at the weekend when people come from miles around to see and be seen. In the centre of the resort is Muscle Beach, a small enclosed pen where men come to work out in public. Venice Beach was conceived at the turn of the century as a replica of Venice, and a few of the original buildings still exist, although nowadays colourful murals have been added to some of them. Miles of canals were also built, but most were filled in to make roads during the 20s. Those that survived are lined with houses and have paths alongside, making a peaceful haven, in sharp contrast to the lively beach area. Venice Beach is best visited during the day. In fact, it's illegal to walk on the beach at night. It's considered too dangerous. To the south is Marina del Rey. Marina del Rey used to be a marshland. Now it claims to have the largest man-made small boat harbour in the world. There's mooring available for over 6,000 boats, and it's a very upmarket area. Most tourists come here on a visit rather than to stay. The main interest is the fisherman's village on Admiralty Way. This is a colourful collection of restaurants and shops bordering the marina. It's all meant to resemble a New England whaling village. The choice of seafood and fish restaurants is excellent, but expensive. You'll find that as the resorts are busier at weekends, the parking charges go up. The weekday rate often doubles at weekends. Well, that's our quick look at the Los Angeles area. Now, what about the weather? With me, as usual, is Dr. John Thorns of the University of Birmingham. John, what's the climate like in Southern California? Well, they have a Mediterranean climate in the summer, which is very pleasant. But also in the winter, they have temperatures which are warmer than you'd find in the Mediterranean. So it's actually better than the Mediterranean. And indeed, if we look at the average maximum temperatures, you see that they never fall below 19 degrees throughout the year. And they get up to 29 degrees Celsius, which is 84 degrees Fahrenheit in August. Sunshine also excellent, more than eight hours, right the way through from February to October. Rain days, very few, as you would expect, uh, and evening winter, and virtually nothing from May to October. Slightly down, though, are the sea temperatures. The sea is relatively cold because of the cool California current off the coast, and it only just reaches the rule of toe test of 20 degrees Celsius in August. Is that the only drawback to the climate? Well, there are sea fogs on the coast because of these cool currents, and also, of course, you have the famous Los Angeles smog, and this is caused by the unique geography of the area with these cold currents off the sea causing cool onshore winds, high pressure over the Los Angeles basin which tends to trap the pollution in, of course, the, with the coastal mountain range. And of course they have high temperatures, lots of sunshine, and this gives you what's called a photochemical broth with all the vehicle exhaust because there are about 10 million cars in California all churning out pollution. And this leads to what's the formation of what's called ozone, which is an irritant. 
and it can stick around for days and this causes your eyes to water and can give you respiratory problems etc. But they are trying to cut down the emissions and in fact in recent years there have been very strict uh, restrictions on uh, pollution from motor vehicles so it is getting slightly better. And what about the earthquakes? Well, yes, it is one of the worst earthquake zones in the world. And according to the global seismology people up in Edinburgh, in fact, they have an earthquake that you can feel virtually every other day. Uh, a slight damage earthquake uh, two or three times a year. And every three to ten years, a major earthquake, like the one they had in 1989, where 61 people were killed. And these are all related to the San Andreas Fault, which runs right across California. And down in Southern California, they also have the Imperial Fault uh, to worry about. Uh, but of course the Californians are aware of this and therefore they have very high building standards. And indeed if you look at the 1988 quake in Armenia which killed 25,000 people, it was of a similar order of magnitude to the one that only killed 61 people uh, in California. So in indeed if you're going to be in an earthquake, one of the best safest places in the world to be is Southern California. So would you go? Oh yes, I mean I've been five or six times and never really felt an earthquake. Uh, but if you look at the weather conditions, I mean the best time to go, obviously any time really in the summer months, I mean it's in the excellent category right the way through from May to October. I think I'd probably plump for September when it's not too hot, but yeah. still excellent. Thanks, John. Now we'll look at the San Diego area. As I mentioned earlier, there are direct flights from London, or if you drive from Los Angeles, it's 125 miles along the San Diego Freeway, Interstate Highway 5. Alternatively, you can take the train from Union Station in Los Angeles. The Amtrak San Diego runs nine times a day, and it takes about two and three quarter hours. San Diego is the seventh largest city in the United States. It used to be known as a major naval base, but now it's becoming increasingly popular as a tourist area. San Diego is far easier to come to terms with than Los Angeles. It doesn't sprawl as much and has an obvious center. It has its share of high-rise buildings, but it's generally cleaner and less frenetic than its northern neighbor. If you want to get around the city without driving, it's worth considering the San Diego trolley, what we might call a super tram. It's cheap, clean and suitable for the disabled. As well as going into the eastern suburbs, it also goes south, right to the Mexican border. Unlike many American cities, the center of San Diego is still good for shopping. The centerpiece is the Horton Plaza on Broadway a well-designed multi-million dollar shopping complex where you can park easily and wander around pedestrianized areas. The general atmosphere is upmarket, but in fact there's a wide range of shops available. It's an open-air mall on three floors, and the top floor is dedicated to eating places. Here you have a wide choice of foods on offer from many different nationalities. Prices are about average. San Diego has spent a lot of money on a district called the Gas Lamp Quarter. What used to be a sleazy area has been transformed. Streets tree-lined and buildings restored, both for housing and shops and cafes. It's now one of America's largest historic districts, and every Saturday there's a two-hour guided walk right through the area. For such a smart city, you'll be surprised by the number of tramps around the central gardens. Locals say the sunny climate attracts them. However, they don't normally bother passers-by. The city developed around the narrow San Diego Bay. Overlooking the harbour area is the large Spanish-style county administration centre. Nearby is the Star of India, one of a series of floating museums. This claims to be the oldest merchant ship still afloat. There's also the Barclay, used in 1906 to carry people to safety during the great San Francisco earthquake. All around the harbour are very attractive and surprisingly peaceful walks. The whole area is pleasantly landscaped. To locate some of those places, the downtown area is about four miles up the bay from the coast. Horton Plaza is on the south side of Broadway and the gas lamp quarter is to the east. The maritime museums are along Harbour Drive. San Diego is very keen on its history. One particular area worth visiting is Old Town to the north of the downtown area. The old town, the original settlement of San Diego when it was a Mexican rather than an American town, is now a state historical park. Many of the old buildings have been carefully preserved or rebuilt in the original style. It's well geared up for tourists with an information center and guided walks. In one corner of the park is the Bazaar del Mundo, a colorful collection of mainly Mexican shops which are actually more interesting and better value than many of the souvenir shops to be found just outside the old town. San Diego is well endowed with an interesting coastline and many beaches. The sand is finer than further north. 
It sticks to your skin. One interesting coastal area is Mission Bay Park. Here you have the choice of Mission Beach, a long stretch of sand facing into the ocean, often with strong surf, or sheltered beaches facing into the bay. The bay itself is a zigzag of lagoons with many small islands. In all, it has around 27 miles of sandy beaches, though in many respects it looks like a giant landscaped boating lake. SeaWorld, one of the major attractions in San Diego, is in Mission Bay Park, and we'll be looking at that next week. There are a couple of residential districts that we think are well worth visiting. Just across the bay from the downtown area is Coronado. Coronado is an exclusive and refined suburb, home for many retired naval personnel. The area is kept immaculately clean and tidy. The shops and restaurants are all very upmarket. The big attraction is Hotel Del, the magnificent Hotel Del Coronado. Right on the beach, it's where they made the film Some Like It Hot, but it's also listed as a National Historic Landmark, and non-residents are allowed to wander around. The shore at Coronado has fine whitish sand and is very wide. It's usually sheltered and seldom gets crowded, even at weekends. To get to Coronado, you have to cross the Bay Toll Bridge. It costs a dollar, but what isn't made very clear is that if there are two or more people in your car, it's free. The other residential area we're looking at is in the northwest. It's spelt La Jolla, but is pronounced La Jolla. La Jolla, Spanish for the jewel, is another wealthy suburb, and the town centre reflects the lifestyle of its residents. The streets are attractive and kept spotlessly clean, and the shops are a mixture of designer boutiques, art galleries and chic cafes. Locals call it the village, and it's a very popular area for window shopping or generally posing. La Jolla Cove is one of many small sandy beaches along the rocky coastline. This area is an underwater ecological reserve and an excellent spot for snorkeling. Even if you don't venture into the water, you're likely to see many examples of marine life on the rocks and in the tide pools. Behind the cove is an attractive landscaped park with paths along the cliff tops. La Jolla has in all about seven miles of cliffs. North of the town is good for surfing. Wind and Sea Beach is rated as one of the best on the Pacific coast. If you're keen to have a go, there are many surfing shops in the area, and you don't have to buy. The equipment can be hired. Well, that's our look at the San Diego area. Now our independent traveller, Matthew Collins. Matthew, where did you go? Well, first of all, I headed for Hollywood, and I don't normally splash out on these trips, but this time I must admit I did, because I stayed in Hollywood in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, which is one of the first hotels built for the movie stars in the 20s and 30s. It has all the original fittings in the bedrooms and in the bathroom up from the 20s and 30s. It has exhibitions of all the stars of that time, and it's actually the place where they do lots of screenings of the new soap operas. So if you want to see the latest edition of, of L.A. Law or Dynasty, you go up there and see the screening. What did you do? Well, one of the things, one of the really interesting things that I did in, in Hollywood was a Star Tours tour. And I, you mentioned you could do it with a map, which is obviously a cheaper way, but I did it with a guide. And the good thing about going with a guide is you get all the latest sort of Hollywood gossip. You really don't actually see that much of the houses. I mean, because they've all had high security fences built and really high hedges, so you can't see much except the front of the house. But you do get gossip. I mean, for example, we turned up outside Bo Derek's house, and uh, the guide said, and this, of course, is where Bo Derek lives, and of course, it's really hot at the moment, it's 80 degrees. The bold Derek probably right at this very minute is out on her sun terrace sunbathing totally in the nude and everybody sort of goes <laughs> well, and of course you can't see anything because there's all these high hedges we got to Barbara Streisand's he house there was this high security fence there and the guy had said poor old Barbara Streisand she had this new security fence bill because she's become really shy of the public ever since Don Johnson left her so everybody looks again don't see much but one of the fantastic things I did see a bit of was Johnny Weismuller's house and his swimming pool because when jo Johnny Weismuller was the first Tarzan and he had in his back garden specially built a one and a half mile long swimming pool or so we're told I saw the first couple of hundred yards of it and it was massive and apparently Johnny Weismuller used to swim a length or a couple of lengths of it every day before breakfast but the most fantastic house we saw on the start of his home was Aaron Spellings and he of course is the producer of Dynasty and he's had his house custom built and so far we've been told that it's costing it's cost 80 million dollars it has 75 bedrooms a garage for 90 cars and all it's going to house is him his wife and his two kids <laughs> 
<laughs> did you get to the Getty Museum? I did get to the Getty Museum. I mean, that's on a par. I mean, that, well, that's much more superb even than the than, than Aaron Spelling's house because it's a mock Roman villa built on something that was discovered uh, uh, at the time of uh, Pompeii. And the interesting thing about the Getty Museum, as you mentioned, is getting there because if you're in a if you're in a car, you sometimes have to reserve a car parking space up to a week in advance. But if you take the bus, you can just turn up on spec and you take the bus and when you get onto the bus you have to ask the driver for a pass to the Getty Museum and that enables you just to walk up without a previous reservation. The Getty Museum itself is fantastic, the villa is superb but the collection that it prides itself on most is its Greek and Roman antiquities and these are superb I mean, you have to wade through rooms at the British Museum to see just any of these things. But the Getty Museum of course has annoyed a lot of people because it has an annual budget of a hundred million dollars a year just to spend on artwork so of course it's pulled up, pushed up international price levels all over the world of art. But I mean the interesting thing about it is seeing the Americans' attitude to all this art and ancient history. I mean one, one of the rooms I really liked was uh, the Impressionist room and you'd see these all these Impressionist paintings that you're totally unfamiliar with. You see these Americans looking at these paintings going, gee, 120 years old, you know, and of course just next door you've got things 5,000 years old. Did you come across any of the famous lifestyle? I did, most evidently in Venice Beach, which I think was actually my, my favourite place. And Venice Beach at the weekend is packed with buskers, musicians, salesmen selling anything, Walkmans, Ray-Bans, food, the whole lot. And one really funny thing about Venice Beach is that all the Californians turn up there to do their cycling. They're all really into cycling. They turn up with their bikes parked on their roof racks or on the back of their cars. They unhitch their bikes from their cars and then go cycling around this cycling track, which is also for roller skaters, and then put their bike on their cars and go home. But the most interesting thing are the buskers. I mean, you see fire, da fire eaters, limbo dancers, all kinds of people, jugglers. And I mean, the, the bug the, some of the buskers that I spoke to, they told me that they could actually make a thousand dollars a day just by busking at Venice Beach. And, and their, their acts are superb, really world class. Matthew, thank you. Now, next week we'll talk to you about driving, accommodation and what you made of the San Diego area. Finally, you'll find that the duty-free shops at both Los Angeles and San Diego airports have only a limited range of goods available. And in America, you buy your duty-free goods in the shops, but they're not given to you until you are about to board the aircraft. Also, the more restrictive allowances apply. For instance, you can only bring back £32 worth of souvenirs or presents. Anything <laughs> Hello and welcome to the second part of our guide to Southern California. Both these programs are concentrating on the two large cities in the area, Los Angeles and San Diego. Our main aim is to offer suggestions on what's worth seeing if you go there on holiday. In last week's program we looked in detail at the particular districts that most holidaymakers visit. This week we're going to look at the major attractions in the area. Firstly, though, it's worth reminding you that both Los Angeles and San Diego cover large areas. Los Angeles is 65 miles from north to south, and the distances between many of the attractions we'll be looking at are quite large. As the public transport system is rather poor, we strongly recommend that you hire a car. Virtually all our featured attractions are open all the year round, although naturally they tend to be busiest in midsummer. Incidentally, most of our film was shot in March. After each attraction, we'll tell you the entrance charges, and because the pound-dollar exchange rate fluctuates, we'll quote all prices in dollars. We'll start with the attractions in the Los Angeles area, and in many respects, these rival Orlando in Florida. The most famous is Disneyland, the original theme park. Disneyland is in Anaheim, a district about 26 miles south of downtown, the central Los Angeles area. President Reagan described Disneyland as one of America's national treasures and the theme park still attracts huge crowds even though it's over 35 years old. In true Disney fashion you'll find the car parks are named after their famous cartoon characters. You can buy a one, two or three day pass but as Disneyland is smaller than Disney World in Florida we think that a one day pass is long enough for most people. Strollers, their name for pushchairs, and wheelchairs can both be hired, and facilities for the disabled are very good. If you're taking a young child, a pushchair at $5 a day is a good investment, given the amount of time you're likely to spend walking and queuing. Main Street USA is the first area you'll come across. It's a turn-of-the-century style shopping street where you can buy souvenirs and gifts. Don't be tempted to buy them when you first go in, as you'll be carrying them around all day. They'll still be there when you leave. In Disneyland, the shops do not run out of stock. 
you'll find Disney characters wandering all around the park, though Mickey and his friends are usually providing photo opportunities around the Main Street area. The park is divided into various themed lands, like Adventureland and Frontierland. In each, all the attractions reflect that theme. Splash Mountain, one of Disney's newest ideas, is in Critter Country, a sort of hillbilly land. Here, a log flume travelling inside the mountain passes a series of scenes from the Br'er Rabbit stories. By adding lights, animated models and music, Disney has taken an ordinary log flume and converted it into what most people thought was a memorable ride. It ends with a 45 degree drop into the briar patch. In Frontierland, the big attraction is Thunder Mountain Railroad. A roller coaster that's been given the Disney treatment as a runaway train. <laughs> Fantasyland is an area aimed at young children. Here the most popular ride is Dumbo the Elephant. The Mad Hatter's tea party is almost guaranteed to make the most adventurous parent feel dizzy. Nearby is Matterhorn Mountain, a mock alpine scene with cable cars running through the centre. Again, the ride is basically a roller coaster, this time pairs of sledges going up and down the Alps. One high spot is the abominable snowman. The other is the inevitable lake. Disneyland is very busy for most of the year and queuing for rides is normal. The quietest periods are usually February and March and October and November, though during the off-season you'll always find some rides closed for refurbishment. Now, what does it cost to get into Disneyland? An adult ticket for a day is $27.50, a child is $22.50, and Disney classify a child as under 12. Once you've bought a ticket, all the rides are free. Also in Anaheim, just a few miles from Disneyland, is Knott's Berry Farm, another well-established theme park. Knott's Berry Farm was a real farm where Mrs. Knott, the farmer's wife, sold chicken dinners. To entertain the customers while they waited for their food, Farmer Knot built a small Wild West ghost town, and from that idea has developed today's attraction. Although nowadays the ghost town is only one section of a large theme park. Cowboy characters stage gunfights and shows throughout the day, and as many of the buildings were shipped from old western towns, the effect is very realistic. Knott's Berry Farm also has rides. This log flume is just one of many white knuckle rides, some considered the most thrilling in California. One of the worst, or best, is Montezuma's Revenge. Here you go from naught to 55 miles an hour in under five seconds. On the parachute sky jump, you fall the equivalent of 20 stories. Although most people find the worst part the going up. And, for young children, there's an area called Camp Snoopy. Here, the rides are considerably tamer, and the whole area is based around a woodland camp with plenty of trees. Rope bridges link the rides. Knott's Berry Farm costs $21 for adults, $17 for children under 12. If you're over 60, an expectant mother, or disabled, there's a special rate of $15. Eight miles west of Anaheim is Long Beach. Here there's a double attraction, very popular with the British, a giant aircraft called the Spruce Goose and that great Cunard liner, the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is now owned by the Disney organisation. You can tour it by yourself with the aid of a detailed plan or take a guided tour. The ship has been carefully restored and many of the original facilities are now on show. This was the playroom. This the hairdressing salon. There's a gymnasium and this was the surgery. Part of the ship is now a hotel. You can stay the night in any one of 390 cabins, all carefully restored to how they looked when the ship was the greatest luxury liner afloat. Nearby is the Spruce Goose, a 200-ton wooden flying boat, the brainchild of Howard Hughes. This was the largest plane ever built and was designed for transporting troops, but it made only one flight, piloted by Hughes himself across Long Beach Harbor in 1947. The huge cargo hold was meant to carry 750 men. Nowadays, the Spruce Goose is kept in a massive aluminium dome. A combined ticket for both attractions costs $17.50 for adults, $9.50 for children under 12. 
There are guided tours every 30 minutes, and these last about an hour and a half. We think it's well worth taking one because of all the fascinating background information you get. Now we'll look at northern Los Angeles. Here the most popular day out is to go on the Universal Studios tour. Universal Studios are in Universal City, north of the Hollywood Hills, about 11 miles from downtown Los Angeles. By the way, in October, there was a spectacular fire at the studios. This hardly affected the tour area at all, and we are assured that all the attractions are now working normally. The Universal Studios tour is a well-organized and busy attraction. On arrival, you buy a ticket, and on the back of it, your tour time is marked. The trams, they're actually linked together more like a train, go every 10 minutes in the high season. As for sets that you'll be seeing on your tour today, uh, when we take you onto the back lot, we'll be driving you through areas like Hill Valley from back to the... Each future. tour has a well-trained guide we'll whose knowledge adds enormously to the enjoyment of the attraction. Uh, Lansbury. Uh, we'll take you through Mayfield where Wally and the Beaver grew up. The tour goes through the back lots of the huge 420-acre Universal site, where many well-known films and television programs have been made. The excitement starts, though, with the specially built set pieces, like where the train goes right through a lake. It's called The Parting of the Red Sea and was inspired by the film The Ten Commandments. On the Amity set, a sleepy New England fishing village, the tour travellers meet Jaws. In Earthquake the Big One, you're in the midst of the immediate aftermath. Firstly, a massive gas explosion, and then you're in a subway station as 60,000 gallons of water burst in. As well as the special attractions, there are many interesting old sets, including a row of houses which have been used in many films. The most famous house was the one built for Psycho. When the tour is over, you can visit the second part of the studios, the entertainment centre. This is an interesting complex of many different themed areas, like Baker Street, with several English-style buildings, and the Moulin Rouge, their impression of Paris. At each, there is a good selection of cafes and fast food outlets, also themed. There are souvenir shops as well, and you're also bound to find some universal characters wandering around. There's a chance to take part in a performance of Star Trek. Visitors can dress up in authentic costumes and makeup and play the part of a crew member. Ah! Scenes take place on the bridge of the Enterprise, in the engine room, on a strange planet, and even on board a Klingon ship. The show is shot by a professional crew, instantly edited and played back to the audience. That looks good. For real Trekkies, this is an opportunity not to be missed, especially the chance to be beamed up. Also, you can visit a series of shows like the Miami Vice Action Spectacular. These are basically stunt shows and are so timed that you can see them all on one day's visit. Each show lasts from 15 to 30 minutes. Once in, all these shows are free, and on your way out, you'll pass a booth where you can get free tickets to some of Universal's TV shows as well. The Universal Studios tour costs $22 for adults, $16.50 for the under 12s and over 60s. By the way, we were given a tip by the staff at Universal that the best place to sit on the train tour is in the first two rows of the third carriage. That's because most of the effects are geared to the centre of the train. Also, if you sit on the right-hand side, you'll get better views, but you may get wet. There is also a much smaller tour round the NBC television studios in Burbank, just to the east of Universal. If you're interested, our advice is to go in the morning. There's usually more activity then. Further north is Magic Mountain, the major theme park in that area. 
Magic Mountain is a 260-acre park offering a wide variety of entertainment. The one entrance fee covers all the rides and the various shows performed throughout the day. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the show. And here's your hostess, my trainer, Suzanne. The more daring can try the Roaring Rapids, a white river ride through cross currents, rapids and waterfalls, although you have to expect to get very wet. Magic Mountain has a good range of thrill rides. This is called the Ninja, a suspended roller coaster. Then there's the free fall machine. During the 10-storey drop, the riders experience almost complete weightlessness. There's also Bugs Bunny World, a children's section where they can meet cartoon characters and ride a traditional carousel. Magic Mountain costs $23 for adults, $11.50 for children, and there they define children as anybody under four feet tall. Magic Mountain, by the way, is open daily from mid-May until early September. For the rest of the year, it's only open at weekends. So far in these two programs, we've not mentioned any attractions in downtown Los Angeles. It's mainly an administrative area, but there are some neighborhood districts well worth visiting, particularly at weekends. Los Angeles has a very large immigrant population. Olvera Street is the hub of the Mexican district. It's always colorful and lively. But at weekends, Mexicans come from all over the area to wander around, to shop and to eat in what they consider to be an authentic Mexican atmosphere. There's a vast range of unusual snacks, but beware, Mexicans have very sweet teeth. Many of the stalls, though, are aimed directly at the tourists, selling cheap leather goods and the inevitable obscure souvenirs. However, this district generally has character and we think is well worth a visit. Chinatown, a few blocks away, is also liveliest at weekends, but it's also busy in the evening. 15,000 Chinese live here, and of course, for those who like their food, it's the place. There's also a wide variety of shops selling authentic products, including gifts. Chinatown in Los Angeles is smaller than the one in San Francisco, but still gives a real feeling of the East. You'll find an alternative Eastern feel in Little Tokyo, the most affluent of the ethnic districts. Tokyo Plaza is a new showpiece, a smart collection of Japanese shops and sushi bars. And in true Tokyo fashion, there are always plastic window displays of all the food available. It's a more expensive area, though very popular with tourists and locals alike. And there's even a quiet and pleasant Japanese garden tucked away in the midst of all the modern concrete. Just to locate those areas, Oliveira Street is near Union Station, Chinatown is about half a mile to the north, and Little Tokyo is about the same distance to the south. We would also recommend going to the Convention and Visitors Bureau, their tourist office, to pick up a copy of 20 free and fun things to do in Los Angeles. Not only does it include museums and historical areas, but also memorial parks, their word for cemeteries, where you can see art collections as well as the final resting places of many film stars. As regards nightlife, Los Angeles has a vast choice, but unless you know where you're going or you're particularly adventurous, we would recommend staying away from the downtown area at night. Well, that's our view of Los Angeles. Now we'll consider San Diego. Remember, San Diego is 125 miles south. It takes at least two and a half hours to drive there. Most of the attractions in the San Diego area involve wildlife. We'll start with Sea World in Mission Bay Park, a few miles to the north of the downtown area. Sea World is a 135-acre marine park. Its most famous attraction is in the vast 5,000-seater Shamu Stadium. The Shamu Show features killer whales performing tricks, often with their trainers alongside. Shows take place throughout the day and are very popular. The whales are trained to do certain jumps near the edge. It's considered part of the show, so think twice about sitting near the front. There are four other stadiums around the park, all with different shows, and it's quite practical to see them all in a day. There are also several indoor exhibits, like the Penguin Encounter, a colony of penguins in a realistic icy backdrop. Humans travel slowly past on a moving walkway. And there's the shark pool, featuring many different species of shark. 
If you're keen to have a closer look at some of the marine life, you can buy food and do your own feeding. And this is called the petting area. In the tide pool, you can pick up sea urchins and starfish, but finders are not keepers. They all must be put back in the water before you leave. Entrance to SeaWorld is $21.95 for adults, $15.95 for children under 12. The other big wildlife attraction is the world-famous San Diego Zoo. It's in Balba Park, just to the north of downtown. San Diego Zoo is very large. Almost 800 different species roam around naturalistic habitats enclosed by moats rather than by cages. Their Sky Fari cable car gives a bird's eye view of the 100 acre site, but from it you don't actually see any area particularly well. It's far better to go on a guided bus tour. It takes 40 minutes and you see about 80% of the exhibits, many from quite close quarters. There's also a mini zoo, especially for children. Here the most popular attraction is the petting paddock, where youngsters are encouraged to get familiar with some of the animals. This area is also the home of a collection of koala bears, including the very rare albino koala. San Diego Zoo costs $11.50 for adults, $5 for children under 16. Given the size of the zoo, we think it's well worth taking the open-air bus trip round it. The zoo is one part of Balba Park. This is a thousand-acre landscaped park containing most of San Diego's galleries and museums. Balba is one of America's finest city parks, an open space of 1,400 acres, but it's also San Diego's cultural center with nine museums, three art galleries and four theaters. The buildings cover a complete spectrum of human ability. The Museum of Art has a gallery of impressionist paintings, the Science Center is a giant laboratory of working displays, and the Aerospace Museum explains the marvel of flight, and all the buildings are within easy walking distance of each other. Most of the museums have an admission charge, usually around five dollars, though if you happen to be there on the first Tuesday of a month, they're all free. Further north, in the smart suburb of La Jolla, is the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Scripps, part of the University of California, has an excellent aquarium. Entrance officially is free, though they ask rather directly for donations. There are 22 tanks displaying local fish found off the Pacific coast and in the Gulf of California. Outside is an artificial tide pool to study life at the water's edge. They arrange a high tide every four hours. Now, a few general points about holidaying in America. You'll normally stay in hotels or motels. These are usually very clean and spacious by our standards, with twin double-bedded rooms and colour TVs. Efficiencies, by the way, mean that the rooms have kitchens. Breakfast is not normally included. At a diner or fast food restaurant, you can get a good breakfast for about $5. Eating out generally is cheap if you're prepared to eat fast food. However, in Los Angeles, there are many good value ethnic restaurants, particularly ones from the Far East. In most states, you have to be 21 to order alcohol. If you look young for your age, carry some form of identification. Health care everywhere is excellent, but expensive. Be sure that your travel insurance has a high medical cover. By the way, at a health first clinic, you can see a doctor without it costing a fortune. You'll often find these clinics in local shopping centers. And as America is totally geared up for cars, it's not normal to go walking in the evening. Most people drive, even though they might only be going a few hundred yards. Now, some more tales of independent travel. With me again is Matthew Collins. Matthew, how did you find the driving? Well, I actually thoroughly enjoy driving in, in Southern California. I mean, after Britain, the roads are a pleasure because they're so broad, you've got multi-lane freeways, and of course all the cars are automatic, so it's a, it's a pleasure after Britain. And, it, and, and another pleasure is actually when you come to park the cars, because frequently in car parks, especially in some restaurants and hotels, you actually have people who park the car for you. So all you have to do them is give them, give them the keys, and they'll do all the hard work. The only problem with driving is that if you hit the commuter hour, it can be a nightmare. I mean, I actually have a cousin who lives in Los Angeles, and 
And she's, she lives in Anaheim, just twenty, and she works in downtown Los Angeles, just 26 miles away. And to get to and from work, she spends about four hours a day in her car. She goes for a jog in the morning, leaves at seven, and spends the journey to work, putting on her makeup, eating her breakfast, and actually changing out of her jogging gear into her working clothes. So don't get caught up in the rush hour. But one of the nice things about hiring a car in, in Southern California is that there are lots of specialist car hire companies around. And I actually hired a car from a place called rent a -Rec. And I didn't actually hire a wreck. What I hired was a 60 convertible Ford Mustang which is what rent a -Rec actually specialises in and you also find other companies that specialise in other cars such as Oldsmobiles certain types of Chevrolet or even movie cars like Batmobiles and things like that so look out for them did you live on fast food? No, I certainly didn't because you really don't need to. As you mentioned, there's such an abundance of ethnic restaurants in Los Angeles that the choice is enormous and you can eat either as cheaply or as expensively as you want. I mean, I particularly enjoyed lots of the Far Eastern restaurants, such as the Japanese restaurants where you could eat raw fish sushi, for example. They were delicious. There are lots of Middle Eastern restaurants, things I've never come across like Ethiopian restaurants, places where you could get Cajun cooking, places where you could get Californian cooking. I ate in the Hard Rock Cafe, which is probably the best Hard Rock Cafe in the world, but it has all these pop stars memorabilia all over the walls, Jimi Hendrix's clothes, guitars that the Beatles actually played with, the Sex Pistols actually played, all those kind of things. But one of the really good things that you might expect in California is there's a vast range of vegetarian and whole food restaurants, and these are delicious and often very good value. The only problem with them is that the fruit and the veg in America is generally really disappointing. It doesn't look, it doesn't taste as nice as it looks. They have these perfectly red spherical apples and tomatoes that look great, but really taste quite bland. You went to San Diego too, didn't you? How did you get there? Well, I got there on the train, and that was actually an adventure for me. I mean, it was an adventure for me as much as it was for the other Americans on the train, because so, they're so unused to taking public transport out there. The most of them found it a real novelty taking the train from, I took the train from Los Angeles to San Diego. And it was great as you stopped along at all these different stations, because the train would actually stop. There were no platforms at the stations. So the passengers would have to wait for the train to stop, the doors to open, stairs to come down. They'd actually have to climb up onto the train. Another nice thing about being on the trains was that you had all the guards and the guy who ran the restaurant, for example, looked like characters straight out of the movies because of the very sort of flamboyant uniforms that they wore. But the nicest thing of all on arriving in San Diego was the station there, because it's absolutely beautiful. It's a mock Moorish station with these old kind of Moorish arches in it, kind of marble floor, cer Spanish ceramic tiles, and even chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. No graffiti, no vandalism, and very, very quiet because not many people use it. What did you think of San Diego? Well, I really enjoyed San Diego. After the sort of manic atmosphere of Los Angeles, it was really nice to get to a place which genuinely does have a much more low-key flavour to it, and also to get to a place where it has a really accessible nucleus. The downtown area of San Diego is a real sort of centre of the town, and this is good for nightlife as well as shopping. But one thing I really enjoyed doing in San Diego was taking the trolley, or the tram as we would know it, down to the Mexican border. And you take the trolley down to the Mexican border, and then you can walk across a bridge into Mexico. Mexico and the contrast from going from one of the one of the richest countries on the planet to the third world in just a matter of footsteps is so enormous because suddenly you're in this third world country where little kids are begging, people are chasing you for money, people are sleeping on the streets. But uh, lots of American people like it because apart from the contrast it's a duty free place so it's great for tequila slammers and good discos and partying and things like that. Any tips? Yeah, make sure you look out for local papers because they're always well worth having because apart from details of listings, they're good for restaurant special offers. I mean, you can often find in local papers newspaper cuttings which will give you, say, $2 off or $5 off in certain restaurants if you go before a certain time. So look out for them. Thank you, Matthew. Many British holidaymakers who go to Southern California also try to see some other parts of the Western United States. Given the distances involved, where is it practical to go to? While San Francisco to the north is an obvious attraction, seeing the Golden Gate Bridge is a must for visitors, as is a ride on one of the famous cable trams. San Francisco is 383 miles from Los Angeles on Highway 1, a spectacular road along the coast. It goes through Santa Barbara, where President Reagan has his ranch, Monterey and Santa Cruz. You should ideally allow two days for ticket here. Yosemite National Park is another big tourist attraction. This is an impressive area of high peaks, waterfalls, big trees and wild cowboy country. It covers over a thousand square miles. Yosemite is 320 miles from Los Angeles. It takes at least six hours to drive there and Yosemite Valley, the most popular area, gets very crowded in summer. Las Vegas is the most concentrated gambling centre in North America, with world-famous casinos offering spectacular stage shows, as well as the fruit machines. 
Las Vegas is in Nevada, across the Mojave Desert. It's 289 miles from Los Angeles and takes at least six hours to drive. To fly, a cheap return costs $94. Finally, just to remind you that the more restrictive duty-free regulations apply. For instance, for personal goods and presents, the limit is only £32. Anything more and you have to declare it, and it's very easy to spend £32. We don't produce a fact sheet, but we are selling the complete scripts of both this program about the attractions and last week's guide to places to visit in Southern California. It's £3.50 for the double pack, and that includes postage and packing. If you're interested in Florida, we have a double script pack on that area too. Hey, 